in its form for Metro President. It will last approximately 30 minutes, just in time to let everybody out in time for rush hour. <laughs> I am your moderator, Betsy Pratt, with the League of Women Voters of Portland. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that works to help citizens make informed choices on elections. We do not endorse any candidate or political party, but rather we give voters the information you need to select a candidate. Membership information in the League is available on our website and at the table at the back of the room. We thank Neil Kelly Design and Paloma Clothing for their generous contributions to our education fund to make these forums possible. Today's forum is being recorded by Metro East Community Media. This is the last of six forums that the League of Women Voters is presenting before the May 20, 20th primary election. All forums will be available for on-demand viewing from a link on our website, go to lwvpdx.org, or you can view the forums on local access cable TV, see the playback schedule posted on our website, and in the program was handed out today. Voters can also look at our nonpartisan voters guides for answers to questions posed to all candidates, as well as a nonpartisan presentation on the ballot measure. The voters guide is here today in print form and is on our website, lwvpdx.org. You will also find free copies at Multnomah County Library branches and at the Multnomah County Elections Office. Another important voter resource is housed in the Secretary of State's website. It is called Orstar and enables you to see the financial sources for campaigns to follow the money if you like. Type O-R-E-S-T-A-R -E into your browser to find that information. Finally, to see information about the candidates and ballot measures that will appear on your particular ballot, go to vote411.org. Just enter your street address and the voter's guide information for only those items on your ballot will appear. And tell your friends about it. They should all go to vote411.org. The candidates in today's forum are running in the May 20th primary election. If one candidate for the position receives 50% plus one vote in the primary, that candidate will be declared the winner. If neither receives more than 50% of the vote, the candidates will appear on the November general election ballot. If you have not yet registered to vote, the last day to do so is April 29th. Contact your county elections office or register online at voteoregon.org. Ballots will be mailed beginning on April 30th. Now to our forum. Let me introduce the candidates for Metro President. Seated in the order in which they will appear on the ballot, beginning on my immediate left are our two candidates, Tom Hughes and Jeremiah Johnson. For each round of questions, I will rotate the questions so that the same candidate is not always the first to respond. Each candidate will have one minute to respond. Members of the audience are also invited to pose questions. Please write legibly on the cards that are distributed for this purpose. Timekeepers sitting in the front row, thank you timekeepers, will signal, signal a 15 second warning and then a stop sign when the speaker's time is expired. So let us begin. Question one, and I'll start with Tom Hughes. What would you like voters to know about Metro and the Metro president's job? Well, uh, thank you for hosting, or for hosting this forum and, and for allowing me to come and speak. And that's a, the, uh, the Metro 101 question that we almost always get. Metro is uh, a, a, regional, a regional government, the only elected regional government in the United States. Uh, my colleagues, my six colleagues on the council, run from separate districts around the around the uh, region. I run from the entire region, so I represent the 1.6 million people that live in the Portland metropolitan area, 25 cities, three counties, uh, and parts of three congressional districts. So we um, we are a large district. We uh, we take out your garbage. We uh, plan the urban growth boundary. We distribute the federal money for transportation. We run the zoo. We run the convention center. We run the uh, we run the um, we have 16,000 acres of open space. And so we're a big and very diverse organization that can't be described in one minute. <laughs> okay. Same question, Jeremiah Johnson. Um, 
Well, that was the, the, the textbook rundown. That is everything that Metro is. I like to say it's the biggest government no one's ever heard of. Uh, most of the time, uh, we'll go out to events like this, and I can ask everybody in the crowd. And unless it's like uh, like Milwaukee Town Hall or something like that, if you say, <laughs> who knows what Metro is, you're lucky if you get half the audience to raise their hand. And that's one of my primary issues in this campaign is not enough people know what Metro is and are able to participate in Metro and know what kind of decisions Metro is making and what they're doing, where their taxes come from and how they're spent and that kind of thing. And I think it's very important because like Tom said, it's 1.6 million. I mean, the only thing bigger than Metro uh, as far as statistically is really our U.S. Senate seats and the governor. Um, so it's a very important government agency that we need to know more about and we need to be more involved with. Thank you. Second question, we'll start with Jeremiah Johnson. What implications does the legislature's recent, recent Washington County Urban and Rural Reserves Compromise have for Metro's future land use planning? Uh, I think it has a good potential. It shouldn't have gone to a referendum. Uh, if the planning process had been more careful, it wouldn't have. Um, it just shows that there are tweaks that need to be done in the way Metro handles some of their planning business and stuff. But I have good hopes that um, I really think the people that were involved with it knew what they were doing. And if we were planning more carefully, it would have went through possibly the first time. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a pretty good plan. There's some things that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, I still think it hasn't really uh, planned well enough for a lot of the green spaces that have been recently procured. Um, other than that, it seems like a pretty good plan. Let me repeat the question f before Mr. Hughes answers. What implications does the legislature's recent Washington County Urban and Rural Reserves Compromise have for future land planning on Metro's part? Well, for the immediate future, it allows us to go forward, whereas the court decision that was rendered uh, basically against Washington County's part of the planning process would have probably held us up for two or three years. Uh, Metro is already starting the process of uh, questioning whether there needs to be another expansion of the urban growth boundary. And in order to do that, we need to know how much land is in the urban growth boundary. And we now know that because the legislature has fixed that, uh, that those boundaries for us. The court decision against Washington County would have essentially put us back to ground zero, starting to look at the urban re rural reserves again. And that process took the better part of three years, five years if you count, um, the, the, the court decisions. And so it really, uh, it really took it out of the courts and, and fixed it where, uh, basically where we were before. So I think it, it is, in, in essence, it's a good thing that allows us to go forward with the planning process. Okay, thank you. Question number three, we'll start with Tom Hughes. What issues face, facing Metro managed visitor venues, including Portland Center for the Performing Arts, the Zoo, and the Convention and Expo Centers need to be addressed? There's a variety of issues, of course, that need to be addressed. The one that we have been spending the most time and have gotten the most press about has been the uh, the headquarter hotel for the convention center. Uh, the expo center needs significant renovation, uh, and uh, the downtown uh, venues that we manage, uh, there are some significant upgrades that we need to begin to contemplate for uh, the Schnitzer and the other the other facilities. The zoo is, we're completing a $120 million bond levy uh, to expand the facilities at the zoo. Uh, the, the key of that that will open next is the elephant habitat. Uh, we also have a, an education unit that's on, online coming up and, and some other things. So there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of growth necessary, a lot of planning uh, that has gone into uh, where, where, how we upgrade those facilities and um, and we're moving on. The, the convention center needs a new roof. Okay, same question, Jeremiah Johnson. Um, you know, a lot of our facilities are really great. I, I really like the PCPA uh, performance, set, uh, sorry, the Portland Center for Performing Arts buildings like the Kelly Auditorium and uh, the Schnitzer and that kind of thing. I think they do a really great job. Uh, I've spoken to some of their staff there. They really like where they work. They really like the community they have at those 
facilities. I think they're under promoted. Um, they're a really great resource and they could be making pro possibly a lot more money if they were promoted better um, and advertised better. Uh, there are some serious issues. There's a lot of people who are very concerned with the health of Packy at the zoo. And that's something that I would look deeply into and let the, the public come in and, and investigate with us so that it doesn't look like a closed book policy on how we're treating our animals at the zoo. Um, there are a lot of issues. Uh, I agree the Metro, uh, the Expo Center needs some upgrades. Um, the convention center hotel i've had some concerns with i believe we should have offered a lot of those opportunities to more local businesses okay question question four we'll start with jeremiah johnson how should metro work with local communities to reduce carbon emissions and prepare for global climate change Ooh. You know, we're such a great city in a lot of ways, uh, just encouraging people to do some of the things that we already do, ride their bike if they can, bus it if they can. That's a, a big issue for me. If we got more people on the bus, which really isn't possible right now with the cuts that TriMet's been experiencing, and a lot of those cuts have to do with the management that's in TriMet right now, and uh, the the current leadership at Metro hasn't wanted to address any kind of restructuring of TriMet. It is a difficult thing to do. It's a big uh, bite, you know, to, to settle into. So it's not something that's going to be easy, but I think we do have to make hard decisions like that to make sure that we have the resources for people to make less of a carbon footprint on things like transportation. Um, really funding those green spaces is going to be key because that's where a lot of our carbon is going to be offset is in the green spaces. So if we're not funding them properly, uh, eventually they're going to have to be sold off to make up for any loss of revenue that we have taking care of them. So. Thank you. Tom Hughes, same question. The uh, legislature in uh, 07, in, their tran in the transportation bill, passed a mandate on to Metro that by the end of this year, uh, we develop a plan along with our, uh, along with our communities, our partner communities, uh, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in uh, small cars and, and light trucks by 20% by the year 2035. Uh, a daunting task considering that we anticipate um, at least a 50%, if not a 75% growth in population during that period of time. So we have been working with our uh, neighboring communities uh, uh, on what we call the uh, Climate Smart Communities Plan. One of the things that we discovered when we uh, adopted the, the, the new tack that we have adopted at Metro, which is to go to our local communities and say, what would you like to do? We discovered when we put all of that together, we actually reach our goal. The question is now, how do we fund the projects that the local governments have in place and plan for? And so we're gonna go back to the legislature and say, we can get there, but we need the money. Thank you. Question five, we'll start with Tom Hughes. How can Metro use its resources to improve linkage or access between work and homes for low-income workers? You know, one of the things that we've tried to do uh, is to take a look at where there are underserved communities and how uh, to address the, the, the needs of those underserved communities, particularly through, uh, through transit, uh, but also by locating jobs closer to those communities. That's one of the one of the reasons why the Convention Center Hotel, for example, is as important as it is. It's 900 jobs located uh, right on top of a neighborhood that has been underserved for years and, and really requires uh, a lot more jobs, and they're, they're within close proximity so that, that low-income people with relatively little background or training can, employ, can, can be employed in those jobs and and still make a union scale wage. So we've been looking at a number of ways to do that. Part of that has to do with the long range planning uh, for the the tri for the metro system, the TriMet system uh, that we've been engaging in with TriMet and others. Thank you. Same question, Jeremiah Johnson. Um, I live out in Cedar Mill, and up until recently, I had a position as an admin over at Portland Bottling Company, and it took me approximately an hour and 15 minutes to get to work, and then another hour and 15 minutes to get home from work, sometimes longer, depending on traffic and that kind of thing. The reason I live so far out, because I used to live closer in in Portland, is because the rents are escalating, and they continue to escalate. Uh, 
and a lot of the the people that would have worked at the convention center hotel have been sort of scattered all over the city now because of raising rents and gentrification and it goes back to the root of the problem in that on the Oregon State Constitution, we don't have the ability to force developers to have inclusive pr practices, including low-income housing on, on future developments and on current developments. And until we get that to change, uh, the root of the problem really can't be addressed directly. Because as long as the rents are high, people are going to continue moving further and further out where they can afford to live, and they won't. it, it won't matter where you put the jobs, they're going to have to travel a long way to get to them. Okay, thank you. Question six, we'll start with Jeremiah Johnson. How should Metro work with Vancouver to find a regional solution to the Interstate 5 bridge problem? Wow. We're talking about elephants in the room. Uh, you know, it's frustrating when you spend twice as much as you needed to spend on one bridge and you still haven't built one. Uh, it's really a lack of leadership on the state level. Uh, there was just bad plans, and people staunchly stood behind those bad plans, even though everybody said they were bad plans, and they couldn't get the funding for them, and they couldn't get an agreement on them. And when we have that kind of leadership on the state le level, it really it, it kind of ties the hands of anybody in the local governments who are actually trying to work earnestly on any kind of project. I wasn't for the original plan. The Army Corps of Engineers said it was too low, and nobody really addressed that issue. And so, you know, we had people in... Salem just collecting fees to advise and the the advice wasn't making a better plan um, so as Metro President I would put more pressure on the governor and the state legislature to come up with better plans so that we can we can help them out Tom Hughes same question we um, have had over the years we've had an organization called the Bi-State Coordinating Council and uh, that had fallen a little bit in disuse during the process of putting the bridge together because there was a bridge a bridge committee that seemed to, to, to fill the same role. Uh, now that the bridge is officially uh, not an active project, we're going to crank up, and I believe it's Monday or Tuesday of next week, we're going to have the first uh, in a series of, of bi-state uh, meetings with uh, the elected officials from Vancouver and, and Clark County. Uh, I have a pretty good working relationship with the mayor of Vancouver. We both serve on a couple of boards together, and I've, I've known him now since I've been in office. He's a good guy, and I think he's pretty easy to work with. Uh, we st he knows, as we know, that we still have to solve the problem of getting people across the bridge, across the river, and those bridges are inadequate uh, for, the, for the purpose that they were intended. Thank you. Question seven, we'll start with Tom Hughes. What can Metro do to promote job development in our region? There's a number of things that we can do. Metro um, plays a role in a, in a variety of, of areas that are key to economic development, <clears throat> land use planning, transportation planning being a couple of them. And um, we also have some a skill set within our agency that's very adaptable to use for uh, economic development planning and strategy, uh, including map making. And, and we do uh, we're good at modeling scenarios and other uh, and other active planning efforts that can be turned to the task of economic development. I personally believe that as the elected leader of the metro area, it's my responsibility to to meet with companies that were thinking about coming here, companies who were thinking about leaving here, uh, and make the pitch for this region as a great place to locate a business. And I've been doing that over the last four years uh, by traveling to a variety of places to, to talk to companies who, would, who are interested in coming here. Thank you. Same question, Jeremiah Johnson. Uh, we have uh, uh, an incredible opportunity to increase jobs, but I don't think the practices that have happened in the past have addressed those opportunities. There's been a lot of time and a lot of money spent and a lot of uh, development going on in pretty much one big successful project, and that was the Intel expansion. Uh, the problem with putting all your eggs in one basket like that and trying to find the knight on the white horse to come in and save your economy is now Intel's facing a shortage where some of the hiring they might have planned to do might not happen now. I would put into 
practice policies to encourage more small businesses and more entrepreneurs in our own local area. Because if we have development over the entire metropolitan region, and we really focus on helping people build businesses here, small businesses and medium-sized businesses help the businesses that are already here get bigger and expand on their own, then we'll have a good groundwork and a good network of, of business culture here that we can depend on and we don't have to go around the world asking people to move their headquarters to Portland. Okay, eighth question, starting with Jeremiah Johnson. What will be your priorities as Metro president? One, the, the first priority would be to revamp the, the deal on the headquarters hotel. Uh, no one has still adequately explained why we have to guarantee a six, $60 million uh, taxpayer payout to a multi-billion dollar multinational company like Hyatt. Um, there's concerns I have in that this has been talked about as guaranteed union jobs, but government agencies are actually uh, under the state constitution, as I understand it, we can't force union employment or even encourage it. So that's kind of like a trust agreement with Hyatt to, to be able to provide those jobs as union jobs. Um, I'm really concerned with the, the closed book policies of the Oregon Zoo and some of the other metro uh, entertainment facilities or, or tourist facilities. We really need to be impeccable there. And if there's ever a problem, uh, instead of saying, you know, you have to schedule a time and we'll charge a fee, just open the books. Because if there's nothing, no malfeasance going on, then there's nothing to hide and there's no reason not to have an open book policy. Thank you. Same question. Well, mine's a little bit less sexy because um, there's sort of the, the stuff we do that everybody knows about. There's the stuff we do that's kind of important, like picking up the garbage. And uh, all of our solid waste plans uh, come down to 2019. Uh, the contracts for providing those services come to an end. And so between now and 2019, we have to negotiate a new contract with the haulers and uh, with the landfill operators. And so there's some very serious questions that we need to ask ourselves as more and more communities uh, move in the direction of of, res uh, of uh, uh, gathering food food and food wastes separately. Are we going to be able to find a way to handle that without uh, running into the problems that we ran into out in North Plains? Uh, do, does Metro still need to be an operator as well as a as well as a uh, a regulator, or can they get can they do accomplish what they need to accomplish by regulation alone? So I, I think there's a a, a no, number of things in what we call the solid waste roadmap that are going to be important going forward um, to look at. All right, thank you. All right, so that concludes my formal questions. So I'm going to go with some questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm going to start with Tom Hughes. I've got a couple questions about recycling and trash and, and uh, solid waste. Uh, how can Metro advocate more effectively for waste reduction in the region? Um, and the, the parenthetical note was garbage, not, in, not system inefficiencies. Can you have suggestions for dealing with, with uh, recycling and trash reduction? Well, interestingly enough, we have been uh, we have been strong advocates of recycling, and we are in the process now of being so successful with recycling that there's less going into the landfill, and and we actually get our major source of revenue as a uh, an excise tax on the tonnage going into the landfill. So we're succeeding ourselves out of out of business, and in, in, uh, that's one of the reasons why the the, tw the solid waste roadmap is such an important way to go because we don't want to uh, we want to continue to encourage recycling and we're uh, we're looking now at uh, how to encourage for example manufacturing recyclable materials so that uh, things like paper plates and spoons and forks in restaurants uh, can more easily be uh, uh, composted. Uh, and w what I discover is that there's a, a lot of technical in, uh, progress involved in the whole recycling stuff, uh, and, and we're encouraging that as much as we can. Jeremiah? Well, recycling is always a tough one because it's, it's really market-driven, um, and sometimes you, you can't, 
deal with it as effectively as you can because someone else is doing it cheaper. And so the recycled goods and products that say would come out of China or India or something like that are beating your prices and that kind of thing. And, and that's one aspect of it. Um, the failures with like the North Plains processing of some of the solid waste for compost, uh, I would look at more smaller compost processing plants uh, located regionally so that there isn't just this big sort of waste uh, processing in one area, but smaller ones that we could uh, be more successful in like containing smell and processing things more quickly, perhaps do more pickup kind of things. Um, it, you know, it is, it is a tough call when you are depending upon an income and you want people to uh, basically pay you less money by doing less of what you get your income from. It is, it is kind of a sticky situation. Uh, Okay, thank you. Question, and we'll start with Jeremiah Johnson. How would you balance preservation of rural areas with the benefits of development? Well, I believe that before we start looking outward, we really need to look inward. Um, I think it's inexcusable when you have a metro area where you have uh, undeveloped lots um, lots that have just kind of gone fallow. They look like eyesores on the neighborhood whether it's bordered up houses or bordered up businesses or just empty lots that haven't been developed until we can really put pressure on the landowners or at least talk with them and figure out what's sort of standing in between them and helping develop those areas and get sort of 100% efficiency out of the development we could do within the boundaries we already have, it's kind of foolish to look outward. You know, it's like building another room on your house when you've got three bedrooms upstairs you're not using. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to continue to go out when there's so much that you can do in. Um, other than that, really just going back to the principles, because I think there has been a lot of cases where a green space or some good farmland has been plowed up when there was better options. And we we're supposed to look at soil quality and stuff first before we plan a development. Tom Hughes, same question. Well, it's, it's one of the conundrums that we face uh, regularly, uh, not just at Metro, but, but uh, jurisdictions all around the region. Neilsboro, uh, for eight years out in Neilsboro, we, we wrestled with that problem because it is key to who we are as a region and what we, how we view ourselves that we have easy access to rural uh, to rural spaces, uh, the open spaces that Metro owns. Uh, notwithstanding, we need to have active agriculture on the edges of of our uh, region in order to be Portland, and uh, and we have so far we've used our land use system uh, to do that. We're now looking at an urban reserve process that over the next 50 years envisions bringing about 23,000 acres of additional land in the urban growth boundary and preserving 270,000 acres of land uh, around the urban growth boundary for farmland. And so that process, I think, will, will help protect uh, the available farmland that's left. Okay, I'm going to do one more question, and then we'll go to closing statements. Uh, and we'll have Tom Hughes answer this first. How do you use the answers from the opt-in online community, and is there a way that you can expand participation in opt-in? You know, opt-in in, in one regard has been uh, dramatically, uh, in, in fact, impressively successful. We've, we originally thought we needed to get a... Um, we needed to get a panel of about 10,000 uh, 10, participants, and I think we're we're approaching twenty five thousand now. So we've got we've gotten good coverage. It is uh, a little bit light in a couple of areas, uh, communities of color and young people, um, but there are enough in both areas that we can occasionally use it to do um, to do the same as telephone polls by pulling uh, information out of them out of the answers. Uh, I think it's been a great tool for giving us a sort of a general understanding of what people are interested in, what they care about, and how much they care about it. It has its faults in that it's voluntary self-selected, and so only those people who have an interest in those things really uh, pay attention to it. But 25,000 people begins to get to be a fair number of folks. Okay, same question, Jeremiah Johnson. Well, I think, uh, you know, 
the problem is, is we are not going out to communities of color and to the young people. And that is a big problem. And it's, it's been a big problem for a long time. And the problem with opt-in programs and sort of self-selective programs where people have to volunteer their time and their efforts to be a part of the system means that the people who have been shut out in the past aren't going to feel comfortable with approaching that. So it needs to be a balanced approach of where we have programs like opt-in, but we still have other resources to where we can go and find the people and get their information and get their opinion on things on how things are running uh, and it, you just can't sit back and expect everybody to come to you sometimes you have to go to people and if it was just me out there going door to door to the people who in the communities that we were planning something going on that we needed an opinion from I would do that I have no problem in doing the, the hard work and, and the, the, the street level labor on, on planning decisions thank you we will conclude with a two-minute closing statement from each candidate, beginning with Jeremiah Johnson, followed by Tom Hughes. So. All right. Um, well, like I said before, uh, a big priority of mine would be to really look at again the plans for the headquarters hotel and make sure that we're giving the best opportunity to our local businesses and local developers first i would look at opening up the books at places like the zoo to make sure that we're not uh, having any abuses going on that will come back to haunt us later and just being open and honest with the public that funds these programs and who enjoys them I believe that it's going to be crucial to really step in and do something with TriMet on a on a structural level because I don't see a lot of progress there and just letting them uh, fix their own problems themselves. So the next four years are going to be crucial um, in finding you know new funding for garbage services, uh, figuring out new ways to handle solid waste, making sure people are utilizing Metro as a government and knowing what we're doing, what our plans are, so that uh, Portland uh, or Metro didn't have anything to do with like the Trader's Joe decision. But that is something that could happen, and that's something that's going to happen if people didn't feel a part, an inclusive part of the process from the beginning. If they don't feel like they were asked and they were part of the plan, then they just are given this plan. And the example I've given before is, you know, maybe your kitchen needs to be remodeled. Maybe it's needed to be remodeled for 15 years. But if I don't know you and I just wait until you're gone to work one day and break in your house and remodel your kitchen, it doesn't matter how great a job I do, you're not going to like it. You know, you can't just force these things on people and tell them that they didn't have an option and that uh, your opinion's better than theirs and that you know what you're doing, whether they like it or not. You really have to have an inclusive government that people know about, that people feel approachable to, and that they have access to in a multitude of ways. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Tom Hughes. Well, in the next uh, four years, I think they're going to be key to uh, a couple of broad issues that I think are very important for Metro. I was actually elected Metro president uh, four years ago uh, based on the experience I'd had in Hillsborough and um, the ab ability to understand how government plays a role in creating an environment where jobs can be created. I think we are not finished with that job yet. I've played a key role in terms of uh, helping to create the regional uh, economic development entity uh, that now merges public and private partners together to do the job of, of developing a job growth in the community called Greater Portland Inc. I'm on the board of that. I'm also the the chairman, co-chair with an, an Intel employee of the uh, econ uh, the uh, export uh, in initiative. So I have a, I have a, a lot of street cred with the business community uh, on uh, on how to build a business climate that that is sat that will encourage growth and jobs. I also have a good working relationship with almost all of the mayors in the region. Having been one helps. Having uh, been one with them helps, uh, and many of them, even when they disagree with me, uh, they we do it in a friendly, polite way. And they understand that uh, I I have my needs and they have their needs, and we're sometimes going to be in conflict. But I think that I've gone further than any metro official up to date 
in terms of, of getting the cooperation of the local governments. They now begin to see that we're going to do things differently at Metro. We're not going to start with a, here's a problem and we have the regulations to fix the problem. We're going to start with a, we think there's a problem, what do you think? And if you think there's a problem too, how are we going to fix it together? And then try to, pa try to put together all of the solutions that the local governments have come up with. That's been very successful for us on a couple of projects that we've done so far, and I hope to bring that forward in the future. Thank you. This concludes the Metro President Forum. We thank both candidates for participating in our forum, and thanks also to our timekeepers. Please check our website, lwvpdx.org, to view all of our forums on demand and for replay dates, times, and channels for local access cable TV. Pick up the League of Women Voters Voters Guides here or at your local public library. Online, you can check vote411.org for a preview of your personal ballot. Election day is May 20th. As in all Oregon elections, you will receive a mail-in ballot. Ballots must be mailed back early or delivered to an official drop-off site anywhere in Oregon no later than 8 p.m. on Tuesday, May 20th. Postmarks do not count. This is Betsy Pratt for the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you for watching. Please be an informed voter and remember that your vote counts. Vote and encourage all your friends and relations to vote as well. Thank you. Thank you.